Ghost Hunters Wanted. No experience necessary. That's what sucked me into all this. That stupid ad. They even used the Ghostbusters logo. Totally illegal, sure. But it's a Facebook ad. And who cares, right? The familiar logo caught my eye. And the text made me laugh. So I thought, sure, why not? And I clicked on their stupid ad. Past Owners. That was the name of their show. Well, if you can call it a show, it was going to be a YouTube channel. You know their shtick. Going into haunted properties, talking up the murder history, getting excited over every little squeak or draft. Kino was convinced that she had a new angle, though. Nothing to do with ghosts at all. Her hook was SEO and targeted marketing. She was fresh out of ad school and full of ideas of how to reach untapped markets and build a following. Her idea was this. Even people who don't care about haunted houses in general care about haunted houses in their town, right? People like to hear about themselves and their hometown. It's enough a part of them to scratch that itch. Kino was sure that through keywords and locations, along with specific ads, we could pitch each episode of our show to locals. People who weren't already burnt out on the whole ghost hunting thing. I was skeptical, but... She was offering a regular paycheck, and it sounded like fun, if nothing else. The no experience needed in the ad was because she had already lined up her camera guy and the tech folks. All she needed was a gopher to do well and everything else. I had one big question for Kina before I joined up. Do I need to believe in ghosts for this? She laughed. Absolutely not. Only Emmerich does, and nothing against him. But we don't need two Emmeriches around here. That is for sure. So I signed up. As the van driver, cord carrier, coffee getter, and general stuff doer. The team was small. Kina, Moretti, Two guys named Jeff and Emmerich. Everyone seemed genuinely pleased to have me on the team, and I was happy to meet them all, especially Moretti. She was smoking hot. She was the one that was going to be in front of the camera, so it made sense. Not to mention that she had this accent that just... Man... It definitely convinced me that Kina was going to be able to sell this show. That's all I'm going to say. (laughs) The Jeffs were in charge of the cameras. Everyone called them Stan Jeff and Sit Jeff to tell them apart. Stan Jeff was the guy who worked the standard camera. The kind you carry around and film people with. Sit Jeff. Now he dealt with all the remote cameras. His whole deal was run from a control center keeping tabs on a dozen different screens at once. Different skill sets, both camera-based, both named Jeff. I asked Stan Jeff if I could call one of them by the middle name or something. He looked disgusted. Yeah, you could. Except that his middle name is Jeff. Wait, his name is Jeff Jeff? No, his name is Mark. He goes by Jeff just to tick me off. He won't even respond to Mark now. If you don't call him Jeff, he just pretends he didn't hear you. Well, do you have a middle name? Stan Jeff just looked offended. Screw that. I'm not letting him steal my name. I was Jeff first. And then there was Emmerich. Everyone else was in their mid-twenties, I'd say. Maybe 30 for Stan Jeff, but Emmerich had to be 50. 
and a hard 150 at that. He was a happy guy, always smiling, but it looked like he spent his entire life outdoors. And when we found out about sunscreen about a week ago, his skin was weathered and wrinkled, like a broken in baseball glove, and his hair was close cropped and bristly. He looked like Malcolm McDowell, only if he wore a walnut. Emrich was responsible for all the weird tech. EMF meters, infrared stuff, Geiger counters, defibrillators, rubber sir. Now, don't quote me on the names of any of this stuff. He lost me like six words in. Whatever weird stuff might pick up a ghost, Emrich had it and knew how to use it. Between his hard-sided cases and Sid Jeff's banks of computers, the 20-passenger van barely had room for the six of us to sit. Do you think this stuff really can pick up a ghost? I asked Emmerich. Emmerich just smiled. Another skeptic, I see. I mean, yeah, people die all the time. Everywhere. I really think I would have seen a ghost by now if they existed. Well, perhaps you have. Not all hauntings are equal, you know. Haven't you ever felt someone watching you when you were all alone? Or suddenly had your mood shift for no reason? <laughs> Those are your ghosts? They're going to make for some pretty lousy TV. So, you know, we were walking around in the dark when this man suddenly got creeped out. Ooh. Emmerich was not phased by my mockery. Some ghost in minor, some ghost in major. If we're lucky, we'll find something in between. If you're not, my equipment is good enough to pick up even the minor ones. So what you're saying is the show will be you pointing at a meter and explaining that this spike is a phantasm. He shook his head vehemently. Trust me, if we see a phantasm, you won't need any explanation from me. Like I said, not all hauntings are equal. You see, your standard phantom, that is just a lost scrap of a person. You might not even know it's there without serious equipment like mine. Temperature changes, tingling sensations, that's about as far as a phantom can go. On the other hand, a phantasm, now that is a full-fledged evil location. It is a space-bending, time-dilating, hallucinatory murder just waiting to happen. Phantasms are sentient and sadistic. They will lure you in, chew you up, and swallow you whole. If you spot a phantasm, you drop everything and run, if you still can. Emmerich was staring me dead in the eyes. I opened my mouth to make a joke, but nothing came. Check, I said instead. Gotcha, noted. I didn't get it, of course, but then again, Emmerich still came along, so maybe even he didn't really get it then. It was our first location. Kina found this amazing place outside of the town, a full-on mansion called the Macdermont House. It had some kind of intense past. 150 years ago since old man Macdermont murdered his entire family and stuffed himself in the chimney. Now, apparently ghosts haunt the attic and stare out the window forever. Or something like that. I don't know. I wasn't listening. I mean, I was listening, but Moretti was leading and so actually I was just listening to her accent and imagining other words. I kept the van on the right side of the road 
and got us to the McDermott house without incident, so whatever. I think I did fine. The setup went as setups do. Emmerich, Sip Jeff, and I hauled the heavy stuff into various locations around the house and ran cables as inconspicuously as we could. Stan Jeff got a bunch of pictures of the outside of the house and then filmed the ready talking about all the history of this place. Kina helped Sit Jeff get everything up and running, supervised Stan Jeff's camera work for a bit, and then probably took a nap or something. I don't know what producers do. She wasn't helping me haul equipment. That's all I knew. Now, once everything was set up, we all ditched and went out to a nearby pizza joint for dinner. Kina wanted to wait until sunset to get started. So we ate dinner and cracked jokes until dusk. Then we headed back to the house. Ship Jeff parked himself behind his display of monitors and declared that everything was rolling and ready to go. Stan Jeff Emirati took a thermometer and an EMF meter and wandered off to film in various rooms. Emmerich had me grab some of the more esoteric machines and follow him to take sounds or something like that. Kina was off on her own, I thought at the time. Looking back, it was probably already too late to save her. Emmerich and I were down in the basement when my walkie crackled to light. Hey. Where are you guys? Basement, camera four. I flashed my light at the wireless camera we fixed to the wall earlier. Reading the tag. Yeah, camera four. No. Him here, but. The walkie cut in and out erratically, fizzing with static. I waved the light at the camera again. You see the bright light? That's us. Nothing but static came from the walkie. So I took a picture of the camera and I texted it to Sit Jeff. Moments later, my phone buzzed with a response. It was a photo of the camera banks, centered on the monitor labeled camera four. It showed an empty basement room, the same one we were in. I glanced over at Emmerich's machines, which were completely silent. Emmerich was tapping on the walls. Both of us were completely visible to the camera. Ha ha. I wrote back, earlier picture, very funny. Text me if anything's really going on. On the walkie, I said, basement's looking pretty quiet. Stan, Jeff, Moretti, anything up where you are? Come up, said a voice on the walkie. That didn't sound like either Jeff's, and it definitely didn't sound like Kina or Moretti. Uh, Jeff, that you? Come up. I looked over at Emmerich, who shrugged. Nothing down here, he said. We were almost out of the basement when Emmerich paused. How many steps were there on the way down, he said. I don't know, like 10, 12? There are 13 now. Okay, so it was 13, but... Is that an unlucky number of stairs? I don't think there were 13 stairs on the way down. Man, if there were 13 stairs on the way up, then there were 13 stairs on the way down. That's how stairs work. There weren't 13, he said mullishly, shaking his head. I sighed and pushed past him. The ground floor was quiet. I thought about shouting, but... Something held me back. Instead, I reached for the walkie again. What room are you guys in? Come up. Upstairs, then? Or back on the ground floor? Up. <sighs> Thanks, man. Real helpful. I turned to Emmerich. Up, then. He looked concerned. I want to swap out some equipment. Back in the main room, the chair in front of the bank of monitors sat empty. Emmerich and I exchanged glances. Sit, Jeff, I said over the walkie. Where are you, man? I'm with the others. Come up. All right, I 
voice said uncertainly. Eyeing the monitors, I couldn't see anyone on the screens. Emmerich is just grabbing a few things. Come up and join us. Okay, yeah, we'll be right up. I flinched as Emmerich pressed a small box into my hands. What? I started to say, but he pressed two fingers to my lips for the first time since I met him. He wasn't smiling. He tapped a box that was in my hand, which had a post-it note on it. I turned to Max, it said. The box had a single dial with a car radio knob. It had two rubber antennas on top of it, and its back was a single speaker. I gave him a questioning look. If you need to, he told me. Not before. Uh, I don't th- Emmerich put his fingers to my mouth again. With his other hand, he pointed down the unlit front hallway. In the gloom, I couldn't see at first what he was pointing at. And then with a shock, I realized the front door was gone. The large wooden door with its half circle of lead glass above and the rectangular window panels on either side was no longer there. Instead, the hallway terminated in a small alcove with a chair, lamp, and end table. It would have looked like quite a cozy reading nook had I not known that it should have been the way we entered the house. I'm not I tried, but he pressed his hand against me harder, smashing my lips into my teeth. Milwaukee cracked to life again. Come up. Let's go up, Emmerich said. He held up a box identical to the one he handed me and looked at it meaningfully. Then looked back at me. They're waiting for us. Together. We walked up the house's narrow staircase. I counted the steps this time. There were thirteen. The stairs led out into a dark hallway lined with doors. Every one was closed. An aura of menace hung in the air. An almost palpable sensation. I could feel it settling into my lungs with each breath. I tried the first door. It was locked. Emmerich tried the one across the hallway, with the same result. I glanced back downstairs. The steps stretched away into blackness, far beyond the reach of my light. Up. At the end of the hallway, a set of folding stairs led up into a gaping hole in the ceiling. I cast a pleading glance at Emmerich. He gripped his little plastic box and walked towards the stairs. With dread in my heart, I followed. The attic was dusty, black and silent. Our lights barely seemed to pierce the air, illuminating mere feet in front of us. A splintery wooden floor stretched out beneath overhanging beams. Boxes and discarded furniture were strewn erratically about. Oh, good, said a voice. It came from the walkie, but also from above, behind, and all around us. We've been been waiting waiting for for you. you. The walls heaved, then spinning out of the darkness with tangible form. I dove for the stairs, fully willing to crash headlong down them, but instead skipped off the wooden planks. Laughter echoed as I scrambled to my feet, searching desperately for an exit that no longer was there. Behind me, heavy footsteps thudded across the floor, and the static crackled back to life. What? No! No! shouted the facsimile of Sid Jeff's voice. I whipped around and I saw nothing. Instead, a hand caressed at the side of my cheek, and I heard Moretti's soft voice in my ear. We've been waiting for you. Just then, a rough hand grabbed my other shoulder, then spun me around. Up! Move! shouted Emmerich, pulling me to my feet. 
He drove me across the attic, our footsteps drowned out by the cacophony of voices calling out from all around us. Phantom hands grasped at my arms and clawed at my face, but Emmerich's presence was more solidly real than any of them. Was there an attic window? What? I don't know. Maybe. Think. Emmerich told me in a circle, the attic closing in around us. When we first came up here, it stretched in every direction. Now, we were tripping over boxes with each step, and I could see all four walls with a sweep of the light. When we pulled up, did you see a window? A dormer on the house, a circular pane of glass on the top. It doesn't have to open. It just has to be there. Think! The walls were closer now, no more than two steps away. They were closing in forming a coffin. There was no window. There were no windows. There were no doors. There was no escape. Not is. Was. Now was there a window? I don't. And then a scrap of memory caught my attention. A piece of the house's history that Moretti had been reading in the car. A ghost had been seen in the attic window. I was sure of it. Sure she said it. Yes, yes, towards the street, the attic window, then run. And with that, Emmerich shoved me away from him, dropping his flashlight to twist the dial on his little plastic box to the max. As feedback squared forth at an ear-shattering, painful volume, the walls around us wavered, and for just one instant I could see moonlight shining through the window. I charged for it, twisting the dial on my own box high. A tortured electronic scream screeched forth, holding back the walls as I dove bodily into the window, smashing through it into the wide open night, 25 feet above the ground. I don't know how I survived the fall. The ground was soft enough, and I landed just right, I suppose. If you count three broken ribs, a broken ankle, and a broken elbow, just right. Anyway, I know what I do. I didn't even fear the grinding bones until I was back in the van, jamming the keys into the ignition and slamming my broken ankle onto the accelerator to get away. And even then, I didn't stop until the Mac de Mont house was miles behind me and my body was screaming for me to stop and rest. That was almost a month ago. I don't know what happened to the others. Not exactly. I saw Emmerich at the end as I tumbled out into the air. He looked stretched, broken, his limbs bent into unpleasant angles and his skin pulled taut until it started to tear in places. But it was the look on his face that is seared into my mind, the look of horror and hopelessness and horrible comprehension all blended into one. It is the look of a man who knows in terrifying detail everything that is about to happen and understands that knowing will not make it hurt any less. I wonder if he knew that he was saving me at the cost of his own life or if he thought the window was in the other direction and was attempting to offer me to the house as he flung himself to safety. I don't sleep much anymore, minutes at a time. Maybe a half hour if I'm lucky, or unlucky perhaps, because every time I sleep, I'm back in the Macdemon house. Voices taunt me, bubbling up from the darkness. Hands grasp at my body, pulling me back. Hallways stretch away as I run down them, lifting doors away from my reach, and always, Always the whisper. Did you really think I let you leave? <laughs> I think I made it out in time. I remember the glass cutting my skin, the impact with the ground. I can feel the hard cast on my arms and legs. I bite my finger to feel the pain, pick away a scab to see myself bleed. I'm sure I'm here, but then again, 
That's exactly the sort of hope the house would want me to have. <laughs> thank you so much for playing along, and thank you so much for your continued support. If you have a story you'd like me to narrate, please leave it in the comments. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon. And remember, if you hear a sound in the middle of the night, don't go investigating.